Well, kia ora tātou katoa. It's very good to be with you, and thank you, Rodney, for the very generous introduction. I've um, tracked with Thinking Matters, I think, since very early days, although we've been out of the country for much of that, <laughs> much of those 10 years. So it's really wonderful to come, to come back to New Zealand and to actually see an organisation like Thinking Matters flourishing, doing the work it is, and really filling a really crucial gap in terms of uh, fostering conversations all around the country and gathering people like yourself. So, Firstly, thank you to all of you for taking the time on a Friday night, braving the Auckland traffic and coming to have this kind of conversation. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is not your classic apologetics talk. This is not three reasons to believe in Jesus or to trust the Bible or, or a wider set of, of answers, but, but actually to step right back to this question of how do we think about the work of the gospel in wider culture and how do we name the work that we are all doing as people who want to think well about how do we serve Christ faithfully here now in the 21st century, where we have all been called to live at least for a time, um, and, and more widely, how would we as the church, as we think about what it means to, to serve faithfully into the third millennium uh, of the gospel, how would we as a church continue to engage with the wider culture and society around it? And so for me, uh, so my, my personal story, uh, this, this very much resonates with the sense of self. So I uh, grew up in Christchurch, uh, I'm married with two kids and two wee girls. Um, so if I'm covered a little bit with muffin, that's because I left, I left dinner very, very rapidly at the end. Um, but uh, grew up, went to the Christian Union at Canterbury uh, and was involved with, it, with a lot of wonderful friends. Uh, and then as we moved to Auckland for about three years uh, and kept in touch with them, we, we watched a number of them lose their faith. Um, and it was a very interesting, partly because we were only back every six months or so, it was a very interesting experience to have these kind of staggered conversations via email and then in person about every six months. And to recognise that what was going on was wonderful young Christian leaders, but who had not owned their faith in the fullest sense and really not done the thinking. And, and folks who had remarkable capacity intellectually, these are people very often have gone on to do doctorates and, and engage in, in a wide variety of areas and, and still are leaders and some of them obviously still hold a faith at one level, but people who had not found ways to integrate their faith into every area of life. And so for me, if you like, a lifelong passion has been uh, and, and one that continue, you know, as, as long as God keeps calling me, is, is how do we have these kind of conversations about robust faith, grounded faith, imaginative faith, and translated faith? And these have drawn me to, a, to research in areas of history where really what I've been thinking a lot about over the last few years, uh, pursuing doctoral research and then doing further research as well, is the question of what does it mean to say not just that Christ transforms us as individuals through the renewing of one's mind, but to say that the gospel, that what Jesus has done has meaningful implications for all of human history, and I will now step back, uh, that actually works out in culture and society. And this, this works at both levels because con context always matters for us. You and I live in cultures that make certain kinds of life plausible. And so it's really, really important to be sensitive to the ways in which our culture surrounds us. Uh, and as Christians, I think we have a deep uh, obligation a duty, if you like, not just to be sensitive as readers, but to be the kind of people who transform cultures, societies, institutions, organisations, uh, and, and political systems. Partly because of the people who live within them, and because of what this does for the possibilities of faithfulness and gospel conversations, um, but also partly because doing so models the work of the gospel in the world. And to think well out of what Christ has done into all areas of life and to show what that means in social engagement and cultural engagement, in the pursuit of justice, in the pursuit of truth and beauty and wisdom, and all of these things that we hold dear, uh, is in many ways to live out in faithfulness to the new creation. And this too is transformative and redemptive. So what I want to do tonight is, uh, rather than present a vast thesis for you, is tell you a series of relatively small but hopefully targeted vignettes that I hope will be uh, will spark imagination for you, and we'll get some Q and A time at the end. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that we will have a chance to have a bit of a conversation together, uh, going, what does this look like here and now, and what what is this sparking for you, as people who are engaged in questions around uh, who is this Jesus, how do we think about him in wider culture, and and also the, the wider question of what the gospel does for historical. And, and social change. 
And so the stories that I want to talk from are the stories of evangelicalism in the 18th and 19th centuries. So really from about the 1740s through about the 1830s. This is a period when uh, evangelicalism goes from being a very, very small, isolated movement, uh, very much at the fringes of English culture, to becoming a global phenomenon. And the kind of transition I'm talking about is illustrated by comparing these two pictures. Um, this is a very stylized uh, scene, uh, stylized woodcut from 1756. It shows the small committee of a group called the Marine Society. Uh, this is one of the very first evangelical philanthropic societies. Uh, there's 12 men on its committee, uh, and really only about three or four of them are meeting at any one point, so this is quite stylized. And the Marine Society is trying to deal with the issue of itinerant uh, orphan ch uh, children, or sort of um, homeless children in London, and wrestling with the question of uh, how do you live faithfully and how do you engage with the challenges of an urbanising and globalising society? So that's 1756. This scene is from 1841, and this is the annual general meeting of the Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, there are 280 people on the stage, 4,500 people in the room. The building is purpose-built, it's Exeter Hall on the Strand. The, the organ in the back, the giant organ for the hymn singing, is larger than St Paul's Cathedral in London, so this is a big organ. And this is a, this is a hall that seats about 5,000 people, that it was purpose-built for the annual general meetings of evangelical humanitarian and philanthropic societies. And uh, you can't really see it, but on the stage is uh, Prince Albert himself, the, the, the consort of, of Queen Victoria, giving the speech at the Anti-Slavery Society. And so if you like to bookend the story, this is a, partly a story about how evangelicalism goes from this relatively small group of people uh, meeting in pubs and, and meeting around very relatively isolated social issues. How do they engage uh, and how do they build a kind of wider culture such that, without a doubt, you cannot tell the story of 19th century Britain, in fact the story of the 19th century Anglophone world, without talking about the way in which evangelicalism completely salts culture. And this is a story that, ch that involves not just organisational innovation, not just social innovation and cultural innovation, but also, I want to argue, a deep engagement with the work of the mind. And part of what makes this movement so dynamic is that you have people within it, often very, very quietly behind the scenes, who are deeply doing the work and thinking about what are the unique insights that gospel-shaped theology has on pressing social, cultural, and, theolo and, and philosophical issues. And so part of their, their success is not just about a kind of, you know, rally the troops kind of activism, but is actually the fact that they have small groups within this ne these networks, these growing networks, who are committed to doing the deep work of the life of the mind. And they live a kind of evangelical apologetic out of this. To, to frame it in another way, this is uh, a classic uh, painting by William Hogarth, it's from the, se the series The Rake's Progress, painting the story of 18th century London. Uh, and this is the scene where the young man gets basically drunk and loses all his money uh, to wanton woman. Um, and this is, this is very much what's going on in the 1750s, sorry. This is a society that it very much is at the cutting edge of urbanisation, where people who for centuries, uh, many, many generations, their families had grown up in the same context, their, their grandparents lived in the same place, their great, 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 great grandparents, so they are known. They come to the cities and they are suddenly anonymous. And this opens great possibility for different kinds of living, and it doesn't foster faithfulness. Uh, and this is a globalising world as well, where people who, again, had grown up in relatively small parishes, where their great-great-great-grandparents -grandparent were working on the same piece of land, doing the same vocation, suddenly find themselves in a globalising world, sucked off to the far reaches of colonial North America or the Australian colonies. Uh, and this, too, creates significant challenges for how does one live faithfully, uh, and how does, what does the gospel have to say to this? And so whereas in the 1750s, English society is notoriously uh, sexually rebelled, uh, notorious uh, for, uh, for violence on the streets, for drunkenness. Um, Hogarth has another series called Gin Lane, uh, in which he, he catalogues the, the so-called gin alleys, uh, which, are, which have these basic signs that would say, you know, um, drunk for a penny, blind drunk for, uh, for, uh, for tuppence. Um, where people basically, to deal with the challenges of a new, living in these vast, anonymous, disconnected cities where economic life was so much more precarious, 
would essentially turn to drunkenness. Fast forward to the 1840s and 50s, and you see a very, 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 very different society. Uh, one that Francis Place, who was certainly no friend of the Clapham sect, writing in 1829, says, I'm certain I risk nothing when I assert that more good has been done for the people in the last 30 years than in the three preceding centuries, that during this period they have become wiser, better, more frugal, more honest, more respectable, more virtuous than they ever were before. For this transformation, Wesley was partly responsible, but Wilberforce and his friends built on Wesley's foundations, bringing their influence to bear in circles which the Methodists could never hope to reach. And so the story I'm going to tell you centres on this little group that we know as the Clapham sect, that includes people like William Wilberforce, Henry Thornton, Zachary Macaulay, Hannah Moore, and so forth. And if you've seen the film Amazing Grace, it's very easy to romanticise these, these people as heroes. They did live extraordinary lives. But I want to sort of zoom back a little bit and think more widely about what that story meant over four or five generations, how it spread through vast networks, uh, and how the Clapham sect is one of a number of key nodes within this network, but by no means the complete picture of the story. Because uh, one of the challenges I think that we sometimes have in talking about the gospel and social and cultural change is that a, a sort of a caricature of groups like the Clapham sect stick in our mind of, you know, 15 people heroically battling against wider culture, changing the world. Uh, whereas part of what the, the fuller story, I think, needs to be told is that these were people who were incredibly subtle and savvy about how they engaged with the wider intellectual, institutional, <coughs> cultural and societal norms around them and built significant networks uh, that were often very, very, uh, very, very light. Uh, these are not you know, necessarily the most powerful people in the room, uh, although at times they include them. But people who were very, very creative about the way that they worked to transform the culture around them. And so if you like, just a little caveat or a little, or a little um, codicil, which is that part of what I also want to then, then just talk about is, so you'll know widely the story of the, of the Methodist renewal uh, in the 1730s, by which large numbers of people, by the many thousands, and by the time you get to the 1750s, by the tens and hundreds of thousands, are coming to a renewed personal faith in Christ. And this is an incredibly important movement in England. It spreads around the Anglophone world, it spreads globally. Uh, and it is a very, very dynamic movement and very, very rich and, and, and effective in terms of the way it transformed many lives. But part of the dynamic of these kind of mass conversion movements is that, and, it, and it's true of Methodism to a degree, although only to a degree, is that they tend to last only a generation at most. And, and it's part of what you see a lot with mass conversion movements, particularly in wider, religious, uh, wider evangelical religious culture, that 10 to 15 years after the revival or renewal or whatever it's been, the baseline population of faithful Christians is essentially unchanged uh, in terms of numbers and in terms of impact. Uh, one of the dynamics, and it's part of the unique story of what goes on in the 18th century, is that when renewal and revival becomes permanent and, beca and, and when the growth becomes permanent, it is always because the people in that movement have worked out how to imprint what they, have, what they have done on the wider society and institutions and cultures. And so they have changed their church structures, they have changed their art, they have changed their music, they have changed their business practices, they have changed their political engagement. All of these other things embed in a particular kind of way the, the kind of, if you like, the work of the spirit in that moment and make it intergenerational and make it persist across many decades. And so part of the story, and, and it's not just because I'm an historian and therefore obsessed with the long term, but we, I think as evangelicals, or at least I am an evangelical, as someone who claims that the gospel changes you, we have become a little overly focused on the language of the now. And, and don't get me wrong, it's really important. Christ compels you to come now. <laughs> um, that is always the call of the gospel, to convert, to, to, uh, to commit to a cause, to, to engage in the work of, of what is required now. But in doing that now focus, I think sometimes we have lost the ability to talk about the lifelong and intergenerational language with which we need to talk about faithfulness. And faithfulness is not just measured in what you do tomorrow and next week and next month, it, although that is very important. But faithfulness is also measured in what it means over many decades of life and also what are you doing now such that your great-grandchildren are living more faithfully. And so part of my wider challenge and part of why I'm excited about the work of Thinking Matters is that I see an opportunity in New Zealand society. It's, it's, it's part of why I'm involved in a theological college. I see an opportunity for wider conversations 
within the church, but much more widely, because I think this is endemic within all of society. I think New Zealand as a whole doesn't think in this kind of time frame. Um, and we don't know what we're for over long time frames. You know, in 200 years, when they tell a story of these decades, what will they say we were about? Better milk solids production and more efficient, you know, ecotourism experience for foreign tourists. I mean, <laughs> what, what are we for as a nation? We have that opportunity to have this kind of engaged, long-term conversation with our culture. What is meaning, meaningful in the world? And with the church, what does long-term faithfulness look like here and now in 21st century Aotearoa, New Zealand? So all of that by way of introduction. <laughs> I hope that's what you came for. I hope that's what you're looking, you're looking for tonight. And I'm really looking forward to the engagement. So by all means, feel free to stop me, interrupt, ask questions, throw out comments, critiques, if you want to do anything. Um, we'll look forward to talking more. So by way of a few stories, I want to pick on one man in particular uh, to start us off. And this man is a gentleman called John Thornton. Now, Thornton is is actually seated around that table in the Marine Society in 1756. Now, this is him a little bit later in life. Unfortunately, it's the best individual portrait we have of him. Um, he wasn't the most attractive man in later life. But Thornton is a particularly interesting man because he, uh, he is a convert to evangelicalism. He comes to faith in 1754. Uh, and, but he is from a relatively wealthy merchant family. And he has, he has moved with his father's household to a village outside London called Clapham. Where, and his father dies young, so he inherits the family trade business at a relatively young age, which sets him up in, in a very, very interesting place. His wife had had an evangelical conversion experience as a younger woman, and so she works on him, and, and ultimately it's their local vicar, a man called Henry Venn, uh, who, who brings him to faith. John Thornton, therefore, is bridging two worlds. In one level, he's part of these very, very incipient networks of clergymen all around the country and, and others, lay people as well, who have come to describe themselves as evangelicals, gospel people, because they have gleaned the sense that Christ asks a kind of thing more than just attending church and saying, going through the liturgy and so forth, um, but that Christ requires conversion. And, and this is a, a movement that is gaining momentum around England, but it's still very, very sparse. In the 1750s, there's at most 15 to 20 parishes that are headed around England by evangelical clergymen. Um, and these are, these are largely people who are relatively isolated then from the wider structures of the church because they're, they're not given support, they're not always seen in, in a positive light. So Thornton is in that space, but he's also in this merchant space. And he's a young man who is, has gained a personal wealth unusually young because of his father's early death uh, and therefore is given the freedom to be a kind of entrepreneur in a period where Britain is beginning to emerge as the dominant commercial power in the world. And so Thornton has access to global shipping routes, he has access, he's part of what's called the Russia trade which trades up the Baltic which is engaging with uh, communities all around northern Europe. And so through these networks and through uh, and after his conversion, he starts to become interested in the conversations that are going on among a vast number of different religious renewals that are going on around Northern Europe in this period. And because he himself is participating in a kind of religious renewal in, in England, he is very, very attentive to what he's hearing. And he starts joining dots and making connections and recognising that what is going on amongst the Moravians, what's going on in places like of Scandinavia, what's going on among certain groups of German pietists, is very much the same kind of thing. Maybe not using the same language, but that these are movements that are going on. And so he starts to use his shipping networks to draw material together and to collate it and to translate it and to start to distribute it among these small clerical networks uh, he, him, that he himself uh, has been fostering in England. Um, and so what this starts to look like is a change in his religious practice. And so this is a man who uh, has come from a relatively traditional Anglican background, but is now starting to work very, very much on the inner life. And so one, one feature of that uh, is that he writes weekly journals. So every Sunday he sits aside at least an hour to sit down and write these sort of intense journals in which he's reflecting at a, quite a deep intellectual level actually about what he's learning theologically, uh, what he's learning about scripture, but also the integration. So what he's doing with, his, uh, with the, the conversations he's having with his local parish, uh, with friends, uh, and then also what he's thinking about in terms of his business uh, his, his other networks, his social networks, and so forth. And what you start to see is a guy who's become, if you like, by, both by the benefit of his social and commercial networks, 
uh, but also by his sheer intellectual curiosity, a bit of a collector of all sorts of things. And so he's famous for basically working very long hours in, in his business, but then coming home and reading theology. And actually, one of the reasons we know this is because his, his friends bemoan the fact that he keeps falling asleep standing <laughs> while reading theology late at night uh, and, and basically injuring himself. So I'm not recommending this as a kind of practice. But, but I'm trying to give you a picture of a guy who is for whom this is not kind of a sort of a pat activism. This is a guy who's really wrestling through serious questions and trying to understand them and modeling that to those around him. And Thornton becomes part of a center of, of experimentation in the word that is coined at the time to describe their experimentation is philanthropy, uh, lovers of humanity. Uh, we tend to mean philanthropy, we, when we say philanthropy, we tend to mean rich people giving money to poor people who they may feel sorry for, but, but in this period it's, it's much more like what we would describe as social entrepreneurship. Like that scene around the, the, the table in the inn in 1756, small groups of people, six to ten, engaged around a social issue going, how does our faith apply to this? And so what Thornton's doing is picking up issues like orphan boys in London, going, how can we do this? And going, oh, I've got merchant ships and I constantly need a supply of ready sailors. So why don't we set up this thing called the Marine Society that basically takes young boys, apprentices them, gives them all the clothes and training that they need, funds that, and then puts them on the ships, indentures them in such a way that a small portion of their wages goes back and towards paying for the next boy and so on and so forth. And so doing this among a whole range of his merchant networks so that more and more people are getting involved and you actually build the cycle where by the end of the, the decade, by the end of the 1750s, thousands of young boys have gone through this process and they really are actually building a bit of a community of people who are, um, who are engaged in the transform transformation of impoverished London slums, basically. Um, and, and the Marine Society, interestingly, still exists today and there is still a descendant of John Thornton uh, who has been a direct tre who's been a treasurer of that society since 1756. There's, there's still one there today, um, an unbroken chain over more than 250 years. Thornton gets involved in a whole range of other experiments. I'm, I'm going to skip just very briefly though to one. Um, you may not recognize the face, but you might know the name. This is John Newton. And so within this very sparse network of, of evangelical clergymen scattered all over England, Thornton starts to write to a few who he befriends personally. And one of them is this, is this guy called John Newton who has an interesting backstory. Uh, he, has, uh, he was a slave ship captain, comes to, comes to faith in Jesus, uh, gives up that trade, comes back a broken man and enters the Anglican priesthood. Uh, and because he's known as an evangelical, he gets sent to one of the worst parishes you could possibly imagine, which is Olney in Bedfordshire. Uh, and Olney is a parish where there hasn't been a resident priest for, some, for about three generations, and it's a very, very low socioeconomic area. So very, very poor, illiterate people, uh, very low church attendance. And so Newton is wrestling with how do you, uh, how do you basically disciple these people? How do, you, how do you teach them when they don't come and they won't listen to the preaching? And so he has another friend uh, by the name of William Cooper, who's uh, at the time one of England's leading poets, uh, also undergoes an evangelical conversion. Cooper suffers from significant depression, and so Newton and his wife take him in and, and look after him for a number of years, and they build a small community in Bedfordshire. And uh, they start writing songs together. And so what they're doing is that work of translation. They take the parts of scripture that they want people to read. They take uh, Christian doctrine and kind of the, the habits of Christian life, and they take the questions of human faithfulness more generally, and they put them to music. And they get these groups within this illiterate parish singing these songs. And, and it gets collected into what's ultimately known as the Olney Hymns, which has three books. And the first one has 212 hymns in it, uh, it which basically steps you through. It, there's at least one him for every book of scripture. They were particularly fascinated with the Gospel of John, it gets like 30. Uh, the one you would know from those is, is Amazing Grace. Uh, that's one of the few from Olney hymns that survives and is still sung. And what they're doing is taking a little bit of scripture, lifting it out and exploring its theological themes in a way that a group of people who cannot read can still engage with. Book two is then called creatively On Occasional Subjects. And what book two is, is basically thinking about the rhythms of human life itself. Uh, birth, death, marriage, Christmas, Easter, harvest, fall, uh, harvest, autumn, winter, uh, suffering, all of these things that all of us experience. 
And it's a series of hymns around how do you foster faithfulness and how do you think well about being human in these moments. And then book three is on the progress and uh, changes of the spiritual life. And this is a, a series of hymns around basically what we would call the spiritual disciplines. So hymns on praying, fasting, worshipping, uh, meeting with other believers and so forth. These are hymns that are designed to encourage the people to foster the basic practices of faithfulness. And so what starts to happen, of course, is that these, the small community and the small parish, that these people who for a very long time have not engaged in kind of regular church life because they're illiterate, because they don't attend, uh, start to sing these hymns together. And John Newton is describing back to John Thornton, his merchant friend in London, what's going on. And Thornton says, this is fantastic. This is really interesting. I love these stories. Send me these hymns. <laughs> and I will see about getting them published. And so what happens is Newton and Cowper basically package up all their manuscripts and post them off to Thornton, who takes them, personally edits them um, in a study late at night, and then because he's a merchant, because he has access to printing presses and to distribution networks through shipping lanes, uh, he basically prints 3,000 copies and sends them out all over Northern Europe. Uh, and so what you start to get in the, the 1760s and 70s as this process is going on, is that suddenly a vast number of people who wouldn't have accessed a particular way of fostering faithfulness in the world engage with new forms of culture. And this is part of how the evangelical movement actually grows, that they take something that is very, very well worked on in one place that's engaging with the direct needs of that community and working out creative ways to translate it such that this is actually spreading a wider cultural movement. And what you start to then get is people who've never met but and don't even call themselves by the same word but recognize each other because of the common culture that they share. And, and the, the most interesting of these moments is one where two men, one of whom uh, has been converted to evangelicalism through Danish missionary networks in northern India, and the other through German missionary network, both one Scottish, one English, they meet on the streets of Calcutta and they're singing the same hymn and they recognise that they are both quote-unquote evangelical and they found a church together and it's the birth of one of the first uh, missionary uh, settlements in English-speaking Calcutta or in the English territories of Calcutta. And so the, the picture, if you like, of this is, is of creative responses to culture that ask the question about faithfulness, ask the question about engagement, and how do you actually meet the needs of people as they're trying to wrestle with how do you live a meaningful life, as they're trying to wrestle with basic questions of humanness, uh, and, and networks that are creatively thinking through what would then that look like writ out. So that's, that's one vignette. I want to then fast forward another generation to John Thornton's son, Henry Thornton, and I'm skipping off a lot, over a lot of biographical detail here. Um, but Henry Thornton also grows up in Clapham. He grows up, obviously, in his father's household. So he grows up seeing this go on all the time, this kind of experimentation in philanthropy and in social and cultural, microcosmic social and cultural reform and entrepreneurship. And what Henry Thornton starts to do is actually say, well, well look, we, are, we have the opportunity to take this a lot further and to be a lot more creative with how we do this. Uh, and so Thornton actually writes a series of reflections on what uh, his father had done right and wrong. Uh, it's a little bit backhanded compliments, it's in, just for the record, if you're ever going to write personal reflections on your father, be kinder than Thornton is sometimes. But he writes this. He writes, my father is an instance of how much a man may do, with the blessing of God may do, without much learning, without any strong judgment, without political influence, without associates of his own rank in life to assist him in his labor, provided he has the interests of religion in his heart, is active in his disposition, bountiful in bestowing his wealth, which providence had given him, and unrestrained by fear of his fellow creatures. And so while Thornton sort of emerged, Henry, John Thornton the Elder sort of emerges as this kind of prototypical philanthropist, uh, modeling philanthropy to wider society, his son basically says, we can take this a whole lot further and we can do some different stuff than what my father's generation were able to do. And so what Henry Thornton does is he actually says, well, let us start to do this more collectively, more intentionally, more long-term, and more deeply. What would happen if we took the stuff that our parents' generation modeled and kind of experimented with and actually committed ourselves for decades of doing this with a group of us? And so he actually buys a piece of land um, to the north of, of the village of Clapham where he lives, uh, built, uh, there's a, a quite nice house, this is Battersea Warriors, it has a mere 16 bedrooms. Um, you get the sense that this is not a man who struggled for too much wealth. Um, and Thornton actually invites then a number of his friends and colleagues to come and live on this 
this estate and they build two other houses nearby uh, and they, they basically live together and they commit to wrestling with the social and cultural issues of their day. And one of those young men is uh, William Wilberforce, who's Thornton's second cousin. Another young man is Edward Elliot, who's the brother-in-law of a gentleman called William Pitt, who had just become the Prime Minister. So these are, these are well-connected people. And so, actually, that, that curved library, that, that curved room you see there, is, uh, is the Oval Library. It's actually designed by William Pitt, and it's where the group sort of habitually met. Uh, and they, they're basically living in these houses uh, that start off as relatively young men in their 20s, then they start to marry each other's sisters and get all connected and have families. And so these families start growing up there and, and they deliberately built no fences between their houses. So the children are playing together and you get this kind of building community. And that, that's what it looked like socially. But what it starts to look like intellectually and culturally is, is particularly interesting. And I could tell the story of the anti-slavery campaign, which is a whole other talk and interested in its own right, but I actually want to focus on some other stuff that is less well known but incredibly important, partly because I think it relates to the kind of questions that we need to be thinking about in our day and age. So Thornton, Henry Thornton sorry, is a banker um, and a very bright, sorry, this is, this is the village of Clapham. Um, you sort of see all the, the houses around the edge of this triangular common. So just to give you a sense, so it's a relatively fashionable suburb just out of London, just to the point where the coach service has got a bit more regular, so uh, families who are working in the city or working in Westminster can commute in and out. And so it's this hybrid community of relatively wealthy families and also refugees from urbanising London. So about 1,250 wealthy households and about 1,250 very poor households. And that creates a very, very interesting context where a huge amount of social entrepreneurship goes on. Um, but Thornton himself, Henry Thornton, young man, bright, brilliant, and rather than going into merchant uh, trade like his father, he switches and goes into the much less reputable even then career of banking. Uh, and he basically engages in this very, very high risk trade of being a merchant banker at the point at which the global credit economy is just emerging. So this is the point at which basically paper currency is just starting to take off. And where to be a young man in global trade is no longer about the amount of basically gold or capital you start with, it's about the amount of credit you can raise. And there, there are particular reasons why, Thornton is, why Henry Thornton is part of certain kinds of social networks that are very much at the forefront of this. I won't go into them too much, but simply to say that the fact that he has common evangelical faith with a number of other key bankers is very, very important. That there is very, very high trust very early on in their relationships. And so he becomes part of a small group of about eight banks, uh, Barclays, you would recognize the name, and a number of others that basically are at the cutting edge of, a, of the banking revolution in Britain. Just at that point as Britain is really emerging as the, as the world's global economic superpower partly because of the way in which it's able to transform its economy through credit and through the easy availability of credit, which means that entrepreneurs all over every sector of society are able to access new sources of capital and funds to develop things. And so why I tell you all of that is because Thornton himself is a deep thinker, Henry Thornton, and he spends a significant amount of time reading theology like his father did, but also reflecting on this new and emerging science of political economy. And this is shortly after Adam Smith has written, this is the period in which this is the key set of questions that everyone who's anyone at the upper echelons of any major society globally is thinking about. What is an economy <laughs> and how do we manage it? Because it turns out it's really, really important. Uh, and so this is a period in which Britain and France are interchanging global war uh, and, and fighting basically for global dominance. And what's emerging is that it's not so much military strength that matters, but economic strength. And so this is a period in which political economy is everything and very, very important. And so Henry Thornton engages as someone who is thinking deeply theologically, deeply out of scripture, out of uh, Christian theological roots, but also engaging in this other wider set of questions around political economy. Um, and what's particularly interesting is that in this period, almost everyone who is leading in political economy is actually a theologian first, and Thornton is no exception. And he writes over a course of about 10 years, but he, he publishes in 1802, a very, very famous book, which I wouldn't expect any of you to ever heard, have heard of, called um, Pithily, an inquiry into the nature and effects of paper credit in Great Britain by Henry Thornton, MP Esquire. Uh, and, and that's a relatively short title for the 18th century, so you should be pleased. Uh, and what Thornton does in this book is basically develop the first working theory of how a reserve bank 
should work and how a managed credit economy should work. Uh, and he is the guy who basically responds to Adam Smith. Smith writes about the wealth of nations and basically says what matters is when you, when you have a piece of paper, like a banknote in your pocket, that should relate to a piece of gold somewhere basically, a piece of real wealth. Thornton is the guy who, who has the deep insight, no, it's got nothing to do with, the amount, with a piece of property somewhere. It has to do with the fact that one businessman trusts another businessman to pay his debt back. And so what we should be talking about is what we would call consumer confidence and business confidence. And actually the currency supply should rise and fall in response to net economic confidence because what that reflects is the true health of the economy. The sum uh, understanding that all the different players have within the system of how well everyone is doing and how likely everyone else is to be repaying their debts in time. That kind of idea. And so what Thornton then says is we actually need to develop these new kinds of institutions, reserve banks, uh, and basically says that the Bank of England should be doing that. Or it, he, he essentially go, works through his relationship with the Prime Minister to do this for the first time with the Bank of England. So the Bank of England is actively managing the reserve currency of, of England, doing so in a very, very critical time when Britain is desperately in need of finance to fight what was becoming the Napoleonic, the, first the revolution and then the Napoleonic Wars. The critical difference between Britain and France in this period is that the British government and the British, the British nation has found new ways to raise capital <clears throat> in ways that allow them to fight war in a very, very different kind of way. And that ultimately turns out to be a big part of the difference, Waterloo not, not, notwithstanding. Um, and so what Thornton does is he basically develops a theology of trust, and I won't go too much but he go in, into how he does this, but he, if you like, you may know the name John Locke, and if this is boring you, apologies, but John Locke develops a, a framework built out of self-interest, that because I have interest located within myself, therefore everything flows. Uh, and you get a significant movement within the 18th century to develop all morality out of this premise. What Thornton says is, no, no, when, when two people interact over a period of time, there is something else that occurs, a we interest, uh, that's unique to neither of them and not the sum of the parts, but is actually something else. And in a, an economy that is represented by the, the credit that they give each other, by the sense in which they have become trusted trade partners who know that each other is good for what they've, they've said that they'll pay. Uh, and that if you extrapolate that out to a, an economy, that trust then becomes the key measure, not wealth, but trust becomes the key measure of the health of the economy. And then what Thornton then steps back and says, actually you can do this across all of society, and that we th should think of every institution as deriving out of this, this idea of a theology of trust. It's a remarkable step, and I, I won't go too much into what he does with it, but he, he talks quite extensively then about how we would critique major social institutions out of this framework. So he looks at anti-slavery, and Adam Smith's key critique of, anti -sla of slavery itself uh, has been that slave labour is less efficient than free labour, fundamentally, because slaves aren't working for their own benefit, for their own self-interest, they're, they're working for the whip. Uh, and that what you need to do, the re one of the major economic arguments against slavery is that it's less efficient. And so Smith is very, very big on the idea that if you just free the slaves, there'll be a net economic benefit. Thornton says, no, 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 the reason why slavery is so pernicious economically, and this is one of the major risks, is that slavery uh, enculturates people to distrust one of those, those key sets of social relationships that should bring benefit all across life. Um, relationship between employer and employee, between husband and wife who can be pulled apart, between parent and child who can be pulled apart. And that in itself is a reason why it's socially disadvantageous. But also that means when we do abolish slavery, and he's the leader, one of the leaders of the movement to do so, we should be very, very careful not to expect formerly slave economies to suddenly become massively efficient free labour markets, that there will be many generations of reenculturation. And so these kind of insights that they have into the, into the way that humans work become incredibly important for the way they then shape their work in, in the 19th century. To give you one example of, of what, this, what this looks like, Thornton is, is a, he's the treasurer of the Bible Society. The, the, they are trying to raise money uh, to print Bibles and send them around the world. And they have a target in their first 10 years of, of um, uh, about 10 million Bibles that they want to print. The problem is, is that they're not raising nearly enough money. Uh, and so what Thornton, and, and part of the reason is their, 
virtually every society in this period, the, the threshold of their fundraising is really the social capital of the, the board members. So whatever their social networks are and however well positioned they are in society, that's really the threshold of what that society can raise. Whereas what Thornton says is, well, in my business and in my, uh, in my political economic work, I've come to understand that you can build these other kinds of trust networks where people who don't know each other very well can build long-term ongoing trust relationships. What if we could do that in this philanthropic world? What if we could do that with charitable societies? And so as treasurer of the Bible Society, he takes this idea and he writes to every one of his affiliate banks and he says, congratulations, you're now the president or treasurer of the local Bible Society Auxiliary. Uh, and your job is to raise a small committee to get them enthusiastic <coughs> and then to engage in a trust relationship with us as the central committee, whereby we will send you Bibles and you will send us money and you will be able to participate in printing and in translation, in the spread of literacy, in the spread of scripture in a way that you wouldn't as a local society in any way because you can't even afford to buy one printing press. And so he builds this relation, and so he builds these auxiliary societies. So the blue line then is uh, the number of auxiliary societies. The red line is, is Bible society income. And as you see, about, uh, about 1808, 1809, it starts to plateau. That's when it hits the threshold of the social clout of the board. And 1809 is when Thornton starts to experiment with these auxiliary societies. And so as they grow, income grows to the point that by the time you get to 1815, it's crossing about 100,000 pounds, which is the kind of, it's shown up on GDP measures within the British economy in that period. Incredibly remarkable, a remarkable way of thinking about how one might change, the, the completely change the business model for philanthropy. And in this case, this, because Thornton is then the treasurer of about 16 other societies, this very quickly, this model goes out to the, the anti-slavery societies, the missionary societies, dozens of other humanitarian and aid societies all around London. And you get this kind of collective movement by which trust is fostered. And these ideas that the, he has worked on, that he's developed out of theological roots have been applied to social and cultural change. So not entirely impractical. What then you start to see because Thornton is part of the small group that we know as the Clapham sect, who are meeting together in each other's houses, who are all young, engaged, uh, thoughtful people who are committed to doing work together, and who basically their families are growing up together, is that you start to see in Henry Thornton's work on political economy and William Wilberforce writing on, on um, political theory and constitutional issues, in Thomas Gisborne writing in moral theology, uh, in Thomas Babington writing on family theory and early conceptions of sociology, in James Stephen writing on things like anti-slavery and other social reform issues, uh, and in Charles, uh, um, Charles Grant writing on imperial policy. You start to see the same ideas echoing through all their work, and I, I could have given a dozen other examples. The small group of people who we know as the Clapham sect publish about 40 books, in their lifetime, over about 15 different disciplines and areas, and you see the same resonant ideas back and forward between them. And we know that they edit each other's books and works. They are effectively functioning as a kind of intellectual and cultural school. And this is driving not just the fact that these people are also then the boards of about 160 societies, including the RSPCA, anti-slavery, the, the first global humanitarian societies and so forth. But these are people who are engaged deeply in transforming things like our understanding of family uh, and thinking th our understanding of education and transforming the schooling system uh, in actually building in robust intellectual frameworks as to why anti-slavery is not just bad morally, but is bad imperial policy and bad economic policy. And that work, which takes about 30 years from the 1780s, really starts to bear fruit in the 1810s. And it is that work that starts to seep through into the wider intellectual life of Britain and starts to change the minds of key MPs and, and other political movements. And, and so part of what you're seeing is a picture not just of a group of friends who are engaged in good work, and they really are, but a group of people who have committed themselves to becoming an intellectual and cultural school. Uh, and very much a part of the story of evangelicalism is how deeply influential the, the, the ingrained ideas that these people put in their writings comes, uh, and, and how it comes out in all sorts of unexpected ways. So for example, I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit uh, for the sake of time, but for example, in thinking about what family is, Thomas Babington, one of the, one of the men of that set, writes about how basically parents should work not 
to discipline their children, but they should work to earn the trust of their children. He's deliberately taking the trust analogy that his friend Thornton had developed and applying it to families and thinking about how uh, children themselves should then be w working to earn the trust of their parents. So this is the process of how families operate. So Babington writes a book on raising families, which then becomes basically the evangelical text <laughs> for how you raise families. It's like a sort of a, a, I don't know, an early 19th century sort of James Dobson or something like that. But Henry Thornton then says, well, let's make this practical. Let's say this is what it looks like to do this uh, on the ground. And so he writes a series of family devotional studies that they read round the breakfast table and dinner table with children. And so this is the first, at least that I'm aware of, published set of Bible studies where someone is saying it's a really good thing if mothers and fathers sit down at the breakfast table with their children and read the Bible together. Now, whatever your understanding of that work and, and, and out of uh, working around the Bible, what that starts to do is it paints a picture of what the family bond should look like. And it actually completely transforms the understanding of how fathers should interact with their sons and, and daughters and how mothers and so forth. It builds the picture of the romantic family, which uh, those of you who have looked at 19th century history, the idea that one, that domesticity, that being at home together in a family and actually liking your family members and actually getting to know them and building emotional bonds with them and common practices is a very, very good thing and is something that itself should be, uh, should be worked on and honoured and, and built in. And this is a, a relatively new thing. Uh, because that has not been, up until this point, a significant part of Anglophone culture. And so you get these kind of, these, these relatively practical but deeply resonant uh, innovations going on within culture. Um, and, and part of what then starts to happen is it echoes out um, all over the place. So to give another example, um, Thomas Gisborne, one of the other writers, I, I will end with this example, um, Thomas Gisborne uh, writes the key text of moral philosophy that is used by the universities of Cambridge and Oxford for the next 80 years. And he's deriving his morality out of the same common intellectual understanding. And so just as his friend Henry Thornton had used the idea of trust to explain economic realities that we still use today, I mean, this is the, the dominant, you know, those of you who are watching the S&P 500 and the, you know, the FTSE and so forth at the moment, trust confidence. These, this is the language with which we think about our economy now because of Thornton. Um, and it is, Thorn it is when Thornton is rediscovered in the 1930s that the modern, uh, the modern managed currency systems emerge, um, primarily by Friedrich Hayek. Um, so what Thornton is doing in political economy, Thomas Gisborne is deliberately echoing, in fact the two are collaborating back and forward in moral philosophy. And what Gisborne is trying to do is say, what is what does duty look like? What does goodness look like in any profession? And he deliberately uses the language of credit and trust. So they're, they're using the same idea. And he says, look, the term credit has different significance in different, different professions. When applied to a soldier, it chiefly regards courage. That is the, what you want in a band of soldiers charging into battle is that they trust each other. <laughs> That's what courage is. It's actually mutual trust. Um, when to a lawyer, um, it's his abilities. You need to trust your lawyer. It's actually about trust. Um, in commercial language, it means uh, the title to which a trader is supposed to have in the world to confidence and respect to his mercantile and more particularly his pecuniary transactions, which is a long-winded way of saying that the way you know a merchant is a good merchant is because he can pay his bills and that that's what fosters trust. And actually, morality is deeply connected to this idea of the way in which we trust each other and work in society. This becomes an incredibly influential way in which 19th century society thinks about itself, in which the 19th century churches reflect on themselves. And so, in one of his published works, in fact, in a series of speeches he gives to the Bible Society, Henry Thornton then reflects about what this means for Christians engaged in work in the world. And one of the things he says is that we've, we've historically conceived of churches primarily as kind of gathering spaces and, and kind of just uh, kind of preaching or culture preaching institutions. What if we reconceived of them and thought of them in this way as a bit like reserve banks, as institutions that are designed to foster trust between people, trust in a common message and a common lord, 
but also trust in the way that that works out in the world and trust so that a, a small community of people can actually work together on very, very difficult issues and persist in it. And he develops this idea quite widely and, and uses it to argue for why uh, the evangelical uh, humanitarian world should, ex how the, the world should expand and the building of local auxiliary societies and, and what we would recognize as the birth of the full non-profit or NGO world where you have these other kinds of institutions that are deliberately built that sit alongside local and national structures that funnel particular kinds of uh, effort at particular issues. So, so when you look at a society that's addressing the issue of blindness or literacy or uh, famine in Africa or any particular issue, you can trace the lineage of that, of that uh, innovation back to this movement without consciously thinking about how the effect that these kind of institutions will have in wider society. So I tell all these stories, I guess, to say a few things, and I'll just let me end with a few reflections. The first is, I hope you're hearing that this is a kind of intergenerational story of build. And part of what uh, becomes very, very interesting then in the third generation is that the children who'd grown up under Henry Thornton's family devotional studies, they too carry forward and they become particularly involved in this wider project of social and cultural change. And they are the ones who work out how to make these movements like anti-slavery, uh, like the Bible Society's mass movements. And they're the ones who then have to build 5,000 seat halls to hold the AGMs of these big societies. Because you now have many, many people going through this kind of common formative process. So just as John Thorne had formed his own sons, his own sons then model that formation in their children and then publish that and get that more widely, you're getting this kind of intergenerational build. The second thing, of course, though, is that the long legacy of the deep intellectual work that has been done over three generations plays itself out in that third generation. And that's, I think, very, very important as well that part of the reason why anti-slavery is not so effective in the 1760s, despite there being strong activist groups and attempts to, to form societies, is because they simply haven't built a robust intellectual framework to, to attack it full force. And it's a powerful, powerful economic engine for the global economy. It's, it's for, you know, the pro-slavery lobby is incredibly powerful in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And it takes 30 years of significant work by a number of basically scholarly people working together, not just in Clapham but in other contexts, to really chip away at the basic arguments <laughs> against, uh, for this institution and to provide an alternative framework for plausibility. And then the third thing, I guess, which, which I think is very, very relevant to the work of Thinking Matters, is to say that arguments themselves always embody in culture. They always get lived out. And that part of what makes an argument strong is the way in which all the little institutions and practices and kind of all the cultural paraphernalia that sits around all of us, our practices, our habits, our, 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 the things we do when we brush our teeth in the morning, these make arguments more or less plausible. They make beliefs, they make claims to truth more or less plausible, at least in, in, in first instance. And the more that we can build cultural forms that make the gospel more plausible to live, to be a form of human flourishing in the 21st century, the more effective the work of apologetics is going to be. Because ultimately people have to live <laughs> and they live in patterns and habits that are so often uh, pre-thinking but also so often not fully thought through. And these patterns and habits themselves can spread virally, as culture always does, in ways that then allow that, that wider work of persuasion that always goes on and always should be going on to really make it, really take its mark. And part of, I think, my challenge to the contemporary church in New Zealand is that I think we've probably under-emphasised that work at times. We have not focused on what someone like a James Smith, the, the, um, the scholar, North American scholar, calls cultural liturgies. The, the practices, the habits, the symbols that sit around are persuasive arguments that make people more or less inclined <laughs> to, to find them plausible. And we need to be thinking about those as well. And a significant part of the story of evangelicalism's success is the way in which th these things never go in isolation. <laughs> They're always being developed together and they feed off each other and they build a sustainable, rich culture that fosters faithfulness, 
over several generations across the world in many cultural contexts and that we, I think ourselves, still very much bear the fruit of today. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you found this in some way interesting. I look forward to uh, engaging with you over questions and so forth, but simply to say that I think what I'm hoping this will have done for you, will, by, by telling a series of stories, will, this is not a model for change, but this is hopefully a way of sparking some imaginative resonance with you to say, what have you got out of this and how, how is this helping you think differently? Um, and I'd love to have that kind of conversation because so much of the work that we have to do here and now is the work of creative cultural engagement. So thank you. Hope you enjoyed this presentation. Please consider supporting us to get more content just like this. Visit support.thinkingmatters.org.nz or click on the link in the description. If you really enjoyed this topic and want to go further in depth, I would recommend purchasing How Christianity Changed the World. Grounded in solid research, this book is both a helpful apologetics tool in talking with unbelievers and a source of evidence for why Christianity deserves credit for many of the humane, social, scientific and cultural advances of the Western world. We stock this book in our online store, which you can find a link to in the description. Music